This is going to be a strange lecture because it's going to be summarised at the end in three letters. If you remember these three letters, that may be the only thing you need to remember about this lecture. Three particular letters. Don't forget the letters. We shall, we shall get there in about 20 minutes. No, just three. Three letters will be enough. However, um, a few obvious bits to start with before we move into the meat of the discussion. Any concept of quality, of course, is relational. We have, I think, now given up the idea that there is some kind of absolute quality. So we have to ask questions like, what is the relation that we're interested in? Um, the concept of the relation is quite central to what I want to talk about. If we go back in history and see where discussions of translation quality started, I think we could say that the, the beginning is really linguistic quality. And there were two particular relations that are at the center of judgments of linguistic quality. Um, one of them is the source text target text relation. Should I get this magic thing out now? Because I could do something with this. But anyway, this one, obviously. Um, in other words, judgments of similarity, judgments of equivalence, or whatever you want to call it, with respect to the source text. That's obvious, so we don't need to discuss that too much, although we might discuss it when we get to the taco player. The other relationship is between the target text and non-translated text. Some people call these parallel texts. In other words, these are judgments of how natural the translation is. How well does it fit into other texts in the target language? Sometimes you want a translation to be entirely natural. Other times you don't want it to be natural. It doesn't matter. Different kinds of translations have different needs and so on. So what you do linguistically when you judge quality is you simply assess these two linguistic <coughs> relations. And actually you use the same kind of techniques for both, notice. In both cases, you are measuring textual difference and textual similarity, but you have a different set of texts in each case, a different, se a different set of reference texts, we could say. In the first case, your reference text is the source text. In the second case, your reference texts, uh, plural, are all the other texts of the same kind written in the target language, these parallel texts, or I like to call them non-translated texts, because some people use parallel texts in a very different meaning in contrasted linguistic, linguistics. It has a different sense, so it's a bit of a confusing term. But you know what I mean, okay? All right, that's the linguistic side. If we now look at functional relations, we can see an interesting development, and this gets more and more complicated. I'm going to show you in the next 15 minutes three or four different diagrams which show how the way people think about functional quality has developed in translation theory. Now the very simplest version is one that looks like this, and it was introduced by the Skopos people. Uh, the Skopos people argued, you remember, that the quality of a translation is mostly determined by the relation between the product and its purpose. Now this is quite different from where we were just now, because the purpose is not something linguistic. The purpose is not a text or a group of texts. So the relationship is quite different, which means that we have to use different kinds of um, analytical tools or concepts in order to analyze what this relationship is. So we need some things like, uh, something like uh, classifications of ty types of, of scopos or types of function, ways of measuring how adequately translations fulfill their functions, and so on. And that actually is quite complicated. It is perhaps a little shameful that we really don't have an accepted typology of translation functions. Everybody uses a different, different set of classes. The EU uses one particular typology. Other people use others. We don't have much agreement here. That is, is a connection to our topic for tomorrow. So if you analyze a product in terms of its functional quality, we need to have, first of all, some concept of what the need is, and secondly, how well the product meets this need. That's all pretty obvious and pretty basic, you might think. But actually, it's quite difficult. It's difficult to analyze needs, and it's even more difficult to analyze functions. But that's the simple version. 
The second version of this function relation, the second attempt to try to draw a conceptual map of this functional quality, is the kind of way of thinking which leads to standards, industrial standards like ISO and the DIN standards. Because the main idea behind these standards, as you probably know, is that if we can control the process, we can thereby guarantee that we can control the product. What these standards do is to try to uh, record and control every single stage in the process of the production of this, this translation product. You know, who, who makes the first draft, who checks it, how is it checked, how is it recorded, who types in the corrections, who does this, who does that. It, what, what happens at every single stage in the process until the bill is finally paid. And if this is all followed through in an acceptable way, assuming that the people who do the work at each stage are competent and qualified, come back to are they good teachers in your, your picture, um, then we assume that the quality of the product will be okay. So this is based on a experience and also on an inference that if the process is okay and the people involved are okay, then the product must be okay. Simple argument. So this, this introduces really uh, three elements in the picture because we have not only the production process itself, but we have the product and the reception. Now in that case, notice, it's a little bit more complicated than this picture we had just now because here there are really only two elements in the, in the relation. <coughs> you have the product and the purpose. And here we are now looked at the purpose a bit more um, in a bit more detail, perhaps, and we've separated out the product and the purpose, and we, the product and the process, and we've added a reception element. So it's the reception side which makes the judgment about the quality. It's the client in the first instance, and then it's the people who read the translators and the publishers, and etc., etc. These people on the very right-hand side of the diagram are the people who judge the quality relation between the product, the process, the process, and the product. So, by bringing in another um, another player in the in, in the in the overall picture, it gets that bit that bit more complicated. If we develop this a bit, we can see something like the following. If we make a distinction between the production process in the middle, and there you see the smiling translator producing the text over here. Now on the left hand side, you have various production conditions. And on the right, you have the reception conditions. So when we talk about uh, the quality of the process, we're really asking questions about the quality of the conditions in which that process takes place. So these production conditions, if you like, they contain, of course, not just the client, but also the resources that you have, the programs, dictionaries, internets, all the rest of it. They include things like the time. Then if we go to the right-hand side, you see that uh, the client appears again. And uh, this is what makes it um, what, gives the, what gives the client in this picture quite a lot of responsibility, a lot of power, because the client is at least formally um, the, the, first, the first recipient of the translator, of the translation. And that doesn't mean that the client will read the text, because if it's into Japanese or something, the client may not be able to read it unless the client is Japanese. But if the client can read the translation, maybe the client will read it, or maybe the client just trusts that it's okay. But at least the client formally accepts it and then pays you at, at some stage, one hopes. Then there are other elements, uh, other people, of course, involved in the reception, the various users, including, for example, teachers, including critics, um, including translation scholars, none of whom are typical users, but they nevertheless are users of translations. 
A very important aspect of reception conditions are alternatives. The existence of alternatives or the possibility of alternatives. Here I'm thinking a little bit of these parallel texts I mentioned just now, these non-translated texts. One tends to judge um, a product not only in terms of how easy it is to use and so on, but in terms of its relation to other similar products, which I might get from another translator. Or if I buy a car, I don't judge it just as a car, but compared to some other car. So there has to be some sense in this reception context of what the alter other alternatives might be. In the case of translation, another alternative might be no translation, but use some other method of uh, create over overcoming the gap between the two sides, maybe learn the other language in, in, long, in the long term, or, or um, have the text understood by somebody who does speak that language, then get a summary, or whatever else you might think. So I think a, a consideration of alternatives is important. This is interesting, this picture, because to me this shows that there are in fact two relations involved here two quality relations. Um, and I think it's very helpful if you think functionally to think of both these relations. And I give the reason why it's important in the next slide. Um, there are two places in this picture where quality comes into the picture. Then. And the first is on the left, because this is the respect to which the, uh, in, in which the translator in the middle actually feels the production conditions to be helpful, to be good. So the conditions have a quality with respect to the translator's work. So that's quality as felt and experienced by the translator. And I think one of the benefits of the, this functional model is that it gives this particular aspect of quality much more space. Notice that in the linguistic model, there was no space for this aspect of quality. And even in the very simple functional model, there is not much space. Nobody asks in the standardization models, for example, does the translator feel that he, has or she, he or she has enough time and enough uh, computer access and so on and so on. This is now made very overt in this model. So this is the quality felt by the translator. Are my conditions of work such, all these things on the left, my production conditions, such that I feel I can work in the best way that I can? <coughs> Why I like this picture is that it puts the translator in the center. It gives the translator the power to say that the product is not good because I didn't have enough time or because you didn't give me a good enough source text, or because any other reasons that you might think of, which are in fact here. Notice anything listed here is not the, the translator's responsibility. You could say that these things are the client's responsibility, or the agent's responsibility. Maybe partly the translator, if the translator has been too lazy to get the right computer programs, or not to learn how to use them maybe, or has left it to the last minute and then is too late and hasn't got enough time. Yes, okay, maybe the translator has some responsibility there. But largely speaking, these are things which are outside the translator's control. And I think that's important because when people talk about quality, they often seem to neglect, they assume that the translator has total freedom of, of movement. And if you see quality like this, it places the translator's freedom of movement within certain constraints. We talked about this also this morning, you may remember, this question of constrained autonomy. Uh, I, th I think it's quite useful. I also like this picture because um, it hi highlights not just the needs of the client or the needs of the translation, if you like, <coughs> but it also highlights the needs of the translator. Um, a translator has needs and if these needs are not met, then it's no, nobody's going to be very surprised if the translation, the, tra the needs that the translation had or the needs that the client had, has, if these are not met. And I would want to see 
quality models of the future, functional models like this. I would like to see them balance what happens on the right, this right-hand side quality relation, to uh, what happens in the left-hand side quality relation. If you are looking, if you are analyzing a, a product and finding mistakes in a product, such as we can shortly do with this example that you have, the taco player example, we will find all kinds of things that we perhaps don't like about the product. And if you then ask, why is this mistake there? Why this stupid sentence? Why this mistake? Why this spelling mistake? Why whatever? It may be that some of the answers will be found in these conditions that I listed here just now, for which the translator is actually not responsible, but somebody else is maybe responsible. If you think like this, then you're really beginning to think ethically. This then connects also with this morning's lecture because it seems to me that ethics comes, comes into this picture in two places. You can say that it comes in on the right-hand side um, at, insofar as these decisions about quality that the translator makes are part of the translator's ethical responsibility. But this, this, the decisions on the left, the conditions in which the translator works, then these are from somewhere else, largely. Not totally, but largely from somewhere else. Um, one of the papers in the um, journal that we looked at, the special issue of ethics from the translator journal, deals with a very blatant case where the needs of a translator were simply not met. They were not paid enough, not given enough, uh, not given enough good enough working conditions, not recognized, and so on. Where you have a junior translator being completely exploited by, by somebody else. You may remember the paper. Now that's a case, I think, of ethics over here, on, on, on the right-hand side of the picture, where that comes in. That's 19 minutes. I've now got my final summary. Okay. What we have, then, is production, condi con production condition conditions, and we have quality reception. Quality is in the middle. But quality relates both to the production conditions and to the reception. And I think the risk is that we just look at the reception and we forget the production conditions. And therefore, grand summary is that. Remember those letters, and you can't go wrong. 20 minutes. Now it's your turn.